can pick up here then. And uh, properties of limits. Now, I think for business calculus, uh, properties of limits, it's nice to know these things and how they work. It's real important for if a student's studying calculus more in depth, like engineering students and math students and science students do. So we're going to go over this kind of uh, briefly. I won't go through as, as much depth on this. Uh, but the idea is there are certain things that you, that you want to know. I'm just going to go through some of these to start with. And the idea is, th let's start with this one. We already talked about this one. So this, what this one says, and you don't really have to write anything down on this, just pay attention to this. Uh, thank you. So the idea is if you had something like the limit as x goes to whatever, it doesn't matter, I'll say x equals 2 of some number, okay, like that. And you don't have to memorize these things, you just have to understand them. The idea with that is, is if you graphed y equals 5, what, what does the graph of y equals 5 look like anyway? Yeah, it's, it's a line, okay? And the idea would be that line always has a y value of 5, right? So that means the value of that limit has to be 5. The idea, we talked about this in the last class, the idea is if you had a line going up 5, well, if you were doing the limit as x approach 2, well, you would end up having, it'd have to be 5. It couldn't be anything else, right? So that's the idea. This is just saying the limit of a constant is a constant. Okay, if you ever forget that, look at the graph. Okay, the graph will open everything up for you then. And then the second one is, says the limit as x goes to c of x equals c. Okay, so let me show you what that is really saying. If you had something like the limit of x, as let's say x approaches 3, okay, what does the graph of y equals x look like? What is that? It's a line, right? Okay, it's a line, and the idea is with this thing, y and x are the same. Okay, that's what this line looks like. If you actually went through and graphed this, you can look at it this way if you want to. It has a y-intercept of 0, like that. The slope is 1, right? So what does the slope of 1 tell you to do? Go up 1, right 1, up 1, right 1, like that. So actually what would happen if you graphed this, if you went to 3, well, the y value would also be 3. Okay, That's what x equals y means anyway, is that x and y are the same. Okay, So what does that limit have to be? It would have to be 3, wouldn't it? It has to be. can't be anything else. So that's what that's saying. If you have a limit of just x, as x approaches c, that's going to be equal to whatever that number is. Does that make sense? Okay. And again, you don't have to memorize that. You just, if you understand how the graph works, you can figure out that limit as you go. Okay. Now, the next thing I want to look at a little bit is, is these things kind of go together. So with this, anytime you're doing a limit of two functions being added, well, then you can just add up the limits. Okay, so you can do the limit of f of x, the limit of g of x, and just add the results together. I'll do a couple of examples of that in a minute. Subtraction works the same way. If you have a limit of a difference, you just do the two limits and then subtract the answers. Okay, I'll demonstrate that in just a minute here. Okay, and then these other things are pretty similar. This one you use a lot if you have a limit of k as a constant, and a constant just means some number, not a variable, but just some number. Well, you can just bring that out of the limit, find the limit of f of x, and then multiply by the result. Okay? And then when you do a limit of multiplying two functions, well, you can multiply the two limits. And then if you have a limit of a quotient, where you have a fraction, you just do the limit of the numerator divided by the limit of denominator and so forth. Okay? So I'm going to illustrate the rest of these things with examples. And, uh, and I'll talk also about what that, how you work with radicals here in just a minute. So just to get you comfortable with this, this is something that is more theoretical. And a lot of times in calculus, you keep going back to the idea of a limit. When you learn what derivatives are and when you learn what integrals are, then you, you kind of go back to the limit and you actually, these are a, an important part of the theoretical development of these ideas. So to get you comfortable with this, I just have, a, this is kind of a typical kind of activity that you do that helps you to learn what these, what these uh, properties are. So let's look at some of these together. 
And the idea with this is, is I'm giving you the limit of f of x is equal to 8. Okay, that's a given. I'm not telling you what the function is. It doesn't matter. I'm just telling you the answer to the limit's 8. So if you go through and look at this, anytime you do a limit and you have a constant times something, you can bring that out. So you want to write this on your notes like this, okay? You want to write this as 4 times the limit as x approaches 1 of f of x, okay? That's what you're doing. That's, that's the purpose of this problem is to show you that property. And the property that, that I'm doing is this property number 2 up here. Or not number 2, it's this one, sorry, no, number 5. I'm doing property number 5, okay? So make a note of that if you want to. Okay, now what we're able to do is we're able to fin finish this up. So what is the answer to the limit of f of x as x goes to 1? It's, it's 8 because you were given that, right? So what that means is, is to get the answer to this problem, you just do 4 times 8. So that answer's got to be 32, okay? Now that's about the only way to, to make sure that you know what these properties are is to give problems like this, okay? All right, let's look at the next one. Now, if you look at the properties, what property do you think this, is, this one's going to go to? If you look at my list of properties. Seven. Yeah, clearly number seven, right? If you have a limit of a fraction, then here's how you handle this. And I do want you to write out the steps on this, even though it's easy to do these things in your head. It really is. What I want you to write down is the limit as x goes to 1 of f of x and then all over the limit as x goes to 1 of h of x. Okay, that's the key step that I want you to write on your paper because that proves to me that you know the limit laws. Okay, now, were you given what the limit of f of x was? Yes, yes that was 8. Were you given what the limit of h of x was? Yeah, that was 2. So that means what you do is you just do 8 over 2, so that means the answer to that problem is 4, and again, that's property number 7. Okay, that's the idea. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, not much to it. You'll see the point of this once, once we start getting into derivatives. A lot of things about derivatives I could not explain to you unless you know some of the theory behind limits. Okay, if you look at part C, which limit law does it look like part C is going to have something to do with? Definitely 4, right? Because that's the limit of uh, subtraction, of a, what we call a difference. So what you do on this one is like this. You just write this as the limit as x goes to 1 of f of x, and then minus the limit as x goes to 1 of g of x, and then you crunch out the details. Okay? Nothing to it. So what's the limit of f of x? It looks like that's 8. And the limit of g of x, what was that? 3. Okay, so 8 minus 3 is 5. And again, that one is following property number 4. Okay, everybody with me on this stuff? Okay, it's pretty logical. You'll, you'll understand the theory behind it as we continue to get a little bit more advanced with what we're learning here. Okay, now these next two things, to finish these up, I want to do a couple more and then just give you a little time to crunch out a couple. Um, you're kind of combining things now, okay? Um, so when you're doing this, I want you to write steps out. A lot of times students just plug in the numbers and get the answer in their head, which I understand. That's not the point of this. The point of this is to teach you how to write out the steps correctly. So you start this one by doing this. You say the limit of the numerator... And then uh, as x goes to 1, don't be lazy about x goes to 1. You've got to write that on there. And then do the limit of the denominator like that. Okay? So that's how you start. All right? Now, what you do with this one, if you look at the numerator, uh, if you look at your previous page, if you have a limit of a product, f of x times gx are multiplied, then you just do the product of the limit. So the next step you want to write is limit x approaches 1 of f of x times the limit as x approaches 1 of g of x, and that's going to be all over the limit h of x as x approaches 1. So, I mean, that's what I want to see on your paper when you're doing that. Like, if you're doing a test, 
I, I want to see that you understand the limit laws. Now you're ready to get your answer. Okay, and that's why students just end up plugging in and doing it in their head anyway, because that's what you do at the end of the problem. So notice the limit of f of x, what is that? That was given as 8. The limit of g of x was given as what? 3. And then the limit of h of x was given as 2. So now it's just an arithmetic problem. So that's 24 over 2. So the answer to that's 12. Okay, but the key thing is don't bypass those first two steps. Everybody with me on that? Okay. Because that's the purpose behind that is for you to learn the laws and how they work. Okay? Any questions so far? Okay. Mostly it's arithmetic. So this one, we didn't do anything with the roots yet. So I'm going to go back to this previous page. This limit law number 8 says if you have a limit of a radical, and that can be a square root or any root, you just do the radical, the limits under the entire radical. That's what that says. So when you're writing this out, you want to write your first step like this. You want to say the third root, like that, and then you want that limit to be under that root. So you say limit x goes to 1, f of x, gx, times g of x plus 3. Okay, well, we're going to do that. And yeah, you could plug in the f of f and g of x. But what you want to do is you want to write down a couple of more steps like this before we evaluate it. So it goes like this. So we have the cube root. If we have a limit of a sum, what do you do? You just do the sum of the limits, right? So we're going to write this next step as limit x goes to 1 of f of x, g of x, like that, and then plus then a new limit. Limit as x goes to 1 of 3 like that. Okay? Now, what can you do with this thing right here, the limit of a product? You're going to do what? Product of the two limits, right? Limit of f of x times limit of g of x. Okay, like that. All right? So, one more step before we start plugging stuff in is we have cube root limit of f of x as x goes to 1 times... Limit of g of x as x goes to 1, and then plus the limit of 3 like that. Okay, so that's the point of the problem is to see that you can put all that together. All right, is everybody with me? Okay, on that. Okay, so just kind of using several limit laws in the same problem. Now you just look up what you were given. It looks like the limit of f of x was 8. The limit of g of x was 3. So we can go ahead and crunch that out now. So let's see, that would be 8 times 3. And then here's one that you want to know immediately. What's the limit of 3? Three? 3, right, okay. That's 3. That's another limit law, okay. So now you're ready to finish it up. So we would have the third root of 24 plus 3. So that's third root of 27, okay. So what is the third root of 27? What do you multiply out 3 times it gives 27? 3, right. Okay. If you couldn't do that in your head, you'd have to get your calculator out or just leave it alone like that. So that's the idea. Okay. All right. Does that make some sense to everybody? Okay. I mean, the arithmetic's easy, but the point is trying to learn how to do those limit laws. So I'm going to give you guys a couple minutes to just see if you can write out problem one and two. So I gave you, I think, the same limits. And just see if you can write it out. Okay, I think you probably won't have any trouble getting the answer, but the key thing is can you write it out okay? As I do these. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and do these. You can keep working on it if you're in the middle of it. Uh, so this first one, you'd want to start by saying the limit x goes to 1 of f of x all over the limit of g of x minus h of x as x goes to 1. Now, see, you could bypass that step, because what are you going to do with the denominator anyway? You're going to do two limits subtracted, right? Okay. So you could actually just write this on your paper before you do your arithmetic. And I'm fine with this if you can do this in your head. You would say, and you got to have that x goes to 1. All right. Then you're ready to plug everything in. So what answer did we get on this problem, by the way? You end up with 8? Okay, right? So it looks like the limit of f of x was 8. 
the limit of g of x was 3 and the limit of h of x was 2. Yeah, so that looks like 8 is definitely the right answer to the problem. All right, everybody okay with that? Okay. All right, now this next one, I don't think I did one with a exponent, but it works the same way that a root does. So actually, you just write this as the limit as x goes to 1 of h of x, then the whole thing is raised to the fifth power. That's all you got to write on your paper, then you do the arithmetic. So that's just like a root, okay? So let's see, the limit of h of x was 2, so you'd have 2 to the fifth, and then you can work that out. 2 to the fifth is 2 to the fifth, 32 or 10? 32. 32. I always see students put 10 on their paper on that. So what are you doing? You're multiplying that out five times, so be careful about stuff like that. All right, 32. All right. So that's the limit laws, and we will come back and, and look at that a little bit later in the semester when we start looking at derivatives. So the next couple of things that I want to go through is um, just kind of doing limits algebraically. So now we kind of get a little bit into the algebra here. Um, so a polynomial, this would be something that in college algebra are finite that you would have worked with some. It's a sum and difference of numbers of powers of x. I'm going to give you a couple examples on that. And then a whole number would just be, and you want to write this down so that you know what whole numbers are. Now we have, and that's just the counting numbers, but you start with zero. Uh, let me give you a couple of examples of polynomials. And we'll be kind of reviewing this kind of stuff that you may have done in a finite math class today too. So what you do to make a polynomial, this is all you do. Okay, you just pick a whole number power of x. It can be anything, like x to the fifth. You can do as many of these as you want, x to the second. You could just have an x. And you could, have, you could even have a constant if you want to, just a number. And then what you do is you can add and subtract those things. So it's sums and differences of whole number powers of x. And you can always have any number that you want to in front of these, or you don't have to have a number at all. That's an example of what we call... A, a polynomial of fifth degree because the highest power is five. Are you guys familiar with degrees from your background? If not, it's very easy. It's just the highest power that exists in the polynomial. Here's one other example. Um, let's just say that we have x to the third, and let's say that we have uh, just an x to the seventh and some number like a half. Well, all you got to do is just add them or subtract them. Okay, that's a polynomial, and that would have a degree of 7. So that's what polynomials are. And if you, if you took college algebra and finite math, and if you learned about these, they, the graphs always look a certain way. They always do this, or this, this, or this. And the thing is, there's no breaks in it. Okay, that's kind of key. So you may have a background for some of that. Okay, so... What we want to do on this, I want to, on this next page, is when you're working with a polynomial, doing a limit is very easy. You just plug the number in and you're, do the arithmetic. But here's the reason why. So I'm not going to take the time. I didn't want to take the time to have you write this down, so I just uh, copied this for you. This right here is a polynomial, right? Everybody agree? That's sums and differences of whole number powers of x. That's what a polynomial is. If you did all these limit laws like I taught you, well, you could break it up into the limit, the sum, and then you can bring constants out, like I brought the 7 out, I brought the 3 out, and so forth. And I just left this alone because that's a line. Okay, And we talked about if you have a limit of a linear function, a line, you just plug the number in and you're done. Well, it turns out that really all you would have to do on this problem, and this is what I do want you to write down, is all you'd have to do anyway is just plug in that A for X, and then you'd have the answer. So what you'd have is, this is what I want you to write down, you'd have 7 times A to the third, and then plus 3 times A to the second, then you'd have plus 4, 8, plus 2. So the point of what I'm showing you is the limit laws are going to tell you that if you have a polynomial and you want to find the limit, you don't need to write all this on your paper. You, what you do is you immediately jump down to the end. You see what I mean? Just plug the number in. That's what you're going to do on a lot of limits anyways, just plug the number in. Okay? All right? 
And it works the same way with a rational function. So a rational function is when you have two polynomials. You have a polynomial in the numerator and one in the denominator. Okay, And the denominator can't be zero because you can't divide by zero. So let's write down a couple of examples of rational functions. Okay, Here's one example. x squared minus 1. That's a polynomial. Uh, put another polynomial in the bottom. Let's say x plus 2. Okay, that's an example of a rational function. Another one would be the numerator can be just a number because a polynomial can just be a number also. One is a polynomial. Okay, all right, and uh, your denominator could be something like maybe like that or something. Okay, so rational functions are fractions. If you did finite or college algebra, that's something you usually study and learn a little bit about. So we're going to work a little bit with that. So what, this, what you're doing with this is, because of the limit laws, whenever you're doing a limit of a polynomial or a rational function, all you're going to have to do is plug the number in and calculate, and that's it. Very simple. You don't have to look at the graph or anything. You're going to know that plugging and calculate is all you've got to do. All right, does that make sense? Okay, so first of all, look at this example right here. What kind of function is that? That's a polynomial, right? Okay, so since it's a polynomial function, that means you don't have to waste your time with those limit laws. You just plug that number 1 in everywhere you see x and calculate. So go ahead and do that. Just plug 1 in, calculate. Okay, and you're always going to get an answer on a polynomial. It will never be undefined. It's always going to work out to be something. Okay. And try to do you know something like this without a calculator. So the other thing is, you know, order of operations. Hopefully you've got that in your background. What do you have to do first on a arithmetic problem like that? You got to do the exponents, the parentheses, the exponents, then the multiplication, and so forth. So this is one to the third is one. One to the second's one. And you can skip a few steps because you can do a lot of this in your head. Then what do you do? You multiply. Multiply, and then you finish up by adding and subtracting. So 2 times 1 is 2, 3 times 1 is 3, 4 times 1 is 4, plus 5, and then you just go left to right, okay? And you want to be careful about that. If you're doing add and subtract, you want to go left to right. So that would be like negative 1 plus 4 plus 5. That's 3 plus 5, and you can do that in your head if you want to. So the limit is 8. So all that means is... If you graphed that on your graphing calculator, I can tell you exactly what you would have, and you don't have to necessarily write this down, but you'd have a function that looks like that. And basically what would happen is when x is 1, you would just have a 0.18. That's what that means. Okay? So you're just plugging the number in. That's it. It's arithmetic. All right? Everybody with me on that okay? Okay? All right. How about the next one? What kind of function is this? Is a rational function. Why is it rational? It's, it's a fraction. So anytime there's a fraction, regardless, it's rational? No, it's got to be a polynomial in the top and polynomial in the bottom. So in other words, if you had square root of x plus 1 over 2, that's not a rational function. It's got to be polynomials. Does that make sense? Okay. So you've got the, the powers of, of x in it. What about like 1 over that's fine. You can see the numerator can just be a number. That's fine. But it, uh, but the denominator can uh, has to have a variable in it. It has to have a variable. Yeah, right. Because one is a polynomial. Okay. Um, so yeah, you could have that as a polynomial also. So anyway, here's what you're learning. Okay, it's a rational function. So what do you do with the one? You plug it in and calculate. You don't have to graph. You can if you want to, but you don't have to. So all we're going to do is just do 5 times 1 to the second plus 6 times 1 plus 1 over 8 times 1 minus 4 like that. Okay, so the numerator you're going to have, and whatever you do in your head, just do in your head. That's 5 times 1 plus 6 plus 1. 8 minus 4, so that looks like that is 12 over 4, so that's equal to 3. Okay? So if you did put that in your graphing calculator, that would just mean when x is 1, y is 3. That's it. Okay? That's the idea. Okay. Any questions? 
Okay, everybody with me on what a polynomial and rational function is? Okay, that's important. Uh, we deal with them all the time. Okay, I'm going to let you guys do these uh, three right here. Okay. So these problems, as long as you got your arithmetic skill okay, you should be good. Um, what have we got for number one? 21. 20, what? One. Okay. All right. Okay. So the only thing that I sometimes see students do on this, be sure when you do that negative T, you square that, you get a four. Okay. Be careful about that. That's a positive times a negative, so that's minus 10. That's plus 7 like that, right? So that looks right. So that would be uh, negative 6 there, plus 7, so that's equal to 1. Okay, arithmetic. What kind of function is this? It's polynomial. Okay, how about the next one? What would you get on it? Okay, that looks right. Okay, and again, sort of operations. Plug in the 2. 2 to the second is 4. Minus 2 to the 5th, you got to work what's in the parentheses before you do the 5th power. So that's 2 to the 5th, so that's equal to 32. And what kind of function is this? It actually is a polynomial, all, and the thing is, uh, if you multiplied it out, which I'm not going to take the time to do because it'd take, you know, forever. <laughs> so if you took that thing and wrote it out five times, multiplied it out, it would just end up having like x to the 5th, x to the 4th just like a polynomial does. So it is, okay? All right, what we get on the next one? Zero. Not zero, yeah. undefined, undefined, yeah, okay? So sometimes you will get something that's undefined, okay, on this, and what that's going to mean is, and we'll learn about this a little bit later, is the limit's not going to exist, okay? It doesn't exist, okay? And we'll get into this in the next section, actually, a little bit here. Uh, to help you understand that a little bit better. This is just 10 plus 3 over 0, so it's 13 over 0, so it's undefined. So what you have, and you may have learned this in college algebra, did you ever learn about asymptotes, vertical asymptotes? Okay, there's a vertical asymptote there, so the graph is kind of going like this. It's going to infinity or something like that. That's the idea. Now, this is a rational function. Okay, all right. So that one is undefined, but the limit does not exist, all right? Okay, now the next thing to finish this section up, um, we want to go ahead and I want to show you kind of what happens on, on this kind of a problem. And you're going to get into factoring quite a bit. So let's go ahead. This is a rational function. So let's go ahead and plug the 1 in and see what we get. So if we do that, you're going to get... 1 to the second minus 1 over 1 minus 1. Okay, plug it in and calculate. So if you do the numerator, what do you end up getting on this? You get 0 over 0. Okay, now 0 over 0 is not 1. A lot of times students think it's 1. It's undefined. You can't divide by 0, period, so it's undefined. Well, whenever this happens in a limit, the limit is going to exist, okay? It's, you don't give up on it and say, well, it's undefined, therefore the limit doesn't exist. You do some algebra to this and then try again. So this is what I wanna, want you to do on this. And then you need to dig into your background a little bit. You're gonna need to factor that. Sometimes when I teach calculus, a lot of times there's a lot of students who need to really heavily review their factoring. Do you know how to factor something like that? Two parentheses, what? X and X, one and one, plus and minus. That's called the difference of two squares. Okay, this one goes like this. All right, so you just say X and X, one and one, 
plus and minus. Okay, that's a difference of two squares. That's a certain kind of factoring problem. Now the bottom, you don't do anything with it. Okay, what do you see happening? You got something that'll cancel out. Good. Okay. All right. So what we have now is we have the limit <coughs> as x goes to one is of x plus one. Well, you just plug it in now. Okay. Now it's easy. You just plug it in again. Try again. You get one plus one. So the answer is two. Okay. That's what you got to do. When you have this zero over zero limit, most of the time you're going to factor. You're going to find something's going to cancel out. Then you do it again. Okay. The big deal that you want to make sure that you know how to do is how to factor something like this. Okay. <laughs> now let's put this in the graphing calculator. So if you did bring your calculator, once you get that out, and I like to use my calculator a lot because it helps you understand what you just did. Okay. So, so actually when you put this in, um, I'm going to clear off. If you have anything in your calculator, you want to, of course, clear it off. So what you want to do, and this is important, when you're doing a rational function, be sure you put the numerator in parentheses. So we'll go parentheses x squared, and then minus 1, and then close parentheses. Be sure you do that. That's real important. Same thing with the denominator. Enclose that in parentheses like that. Okay? So we're going to do that. Now, the window, one thing that you can do on your window if you're not familiar with all these things on the calculator. If you want, you can set the window from negative 8 to 8, but you can also automatically set it from negative 10 to 10, and you'll see me do this all the time. So if you want to go zoom and then go to the one that says standard, zoom 6, what that does is it take, makes it go negative 10 to 10. That's the standard graphing window. Then you press enter, and it'll graph this. Now what it is is it's a line. Okay, actually what, what the graph is, is it's x plus 1. So if you were graphing x plus 1, that, you know that's a line, right? What's the significance of that 1? That's the y-intercept. What's the slope? 1. Okay, so what we want to do is you want to go ahead and graph this like this. Just put a dot at 1 for your y-intercept, and then go up 1 and over 1 like that, and so forth. And then you want to go ahead and just kind of connect those dots into a line like that. But there's one thing on this that doesn't show up on your calculator. And what happens when x is equal to 1? Go way back to the beginning of the problem. What happens if x is 1? Yeah, you have a zero denominator, which means what? means you're undefined. So actually what happens on this is although your calculator is not showing it, technically right there what you want to do is you want to put a bubble there like that. Okay, That's the idea. Now based on what we learned about limits last time, well we got two for an answer. Remember what we looked at last time is if, you do the, if you're looking at the limit as x goes to 1, the left hand limit, isn't that going to 2? How about the right hand limit? Is it also going to 2? Yeah, so that's what happens. Okay, that thing canceled out, so you ended up with a line, but there's a bubble. And if you do this on a graphing calculator, like if you go second graph to open up your table of values, notice there will be an error by one. That means you're undefined there, so there's a bubble. Every other place it's defined. All right, does that make sense? Okay, that's why two was the answer to the problem. So it looks that's what the graph looks like. Okay? All right, any uh, questions about what I just did? Okay, let's see. I'm going to do one more, then I want you to do a couple of them because I need to kind of see where your factoring skill is. So we'll go ahead and wrap this, this up then. So um, I'm going to go ahead and do the factoring on this one. Now what you want to do, you can go ahead and factor if you want to, but I do want to plug in the 2. Let's go ahead and do that. So we have 3 times 2 to the second minus 7 times 2 plus 2. Then we have 2 minus 2 like that. Okay, So we want to see that it's a 0 over 0 limit. If you work out uh, the numerator, that's going to be 3 times 4 uh, minus 14 plus 2. The denominator is 0. So that's going to be 12 minus 14 plus 2. So that's 0 over 0. Okay. 
that you want to make sure that you have that. Now, when the, when you have a zero over zero, here's the thing you want to make sure you know: the limit does exist, but you have to do algebra in order to figure out what to do. So, if you look at this numerator, does that look like something that might factor? Yeah, and let's factor this. This is the kind of factoring problem a lot of times students in this class don't know how to do very well. So I'm going to, at the side, draw two parentheses. Okay, and here's how you do this. It's like reverse FOIL. The first term is 3t to the second. What are two numbers that you could multiply that would give you 3t to the second? 3t and t. That's the only thing that you can come up with, right? Okay. The last term is 2. What are two numbers that you multiply to get 2? 1 and 2. Okay, now the order you put these in is will make a difference on this. So I'm going to start by putting the, the 2 there and the 1 there and just see if it works. Okay, all right. So this is the way I teach this is now the middle term has to come together like this. So that right there, if you multiply, that's a 2t, right? If you do this term, that is a 3t, right? Okay, is there any way in the world you're going to make 2 and 3 add up to negative 7? No. So what can you do? Well, you can change the order of the two numbers and see if it works. Okay? If you need to work on your factoring, this is kind of helpful if you just write down what that inner and outer term are. So I'm going to erase that, and I'm going to try again. I did it wrong on purpose. Okay, so now I'm going to switch the 1 and 2 and see if I can make it come together now. Okay, so now that middle term is 1t, right? That outer term, 3 times 2 is 6t. Are you going to make that add up to negative 7t? Yeah, how do the signs got to go? They're both minus, okay? If you have a minus 1 and a minus 6, then that adds up to a minus 7, correct? Okay, so you have to be on top of your factoring. If you need to review this, review it, okay? All right, now let's do our limits. So what I'm going to do over here is I'm going to write the factors. So I've got the limit is t goes to 2, and then I've got 3t minus 1, then I've got t minus 2, and I've got 2 minus t like that. Okay. Any question about the factoring? Okay, now let me ask you this question. Do these things cancel out? Are they the same or are they different? They are different. So you have to be clever about the way you get them to cancel out. Here's another thing I want to make sure that you understand is t minus 2 is the same thing as negative 1 times t minus 2. Prove that to yourself. If you don't understand it, just multiply it out. Negative 1 times t is negative t, right? Negative 1 times negative 2 is positive t, right? So whenever you have something that's backwards with a subtraction, you can turn it around but you, the way to keep from changing the problem is to put a negative one in front. Does that make sense? Okay, that's important. And you can turn either of them around. It doesn't matter which one. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write one more step. I'm going to do this like this. I'm going to leave the 3t minus 1. I'm going to leave the t minus 2. And then I'm going to change that denominator to negative 1 times t minus 2. Okay, now do they cancel out? Of course, they are the same. Okay, so you can go ahead now and cross those out. So what you're going to be left with is 3t minus 1 over negative 1. Okay, now really, if you divide something by negative 1, all it does is changes the signs. So what this is going to be is negative 3t plus 1. Okay, so that's what you end up having. All right, so after all this algebraic work, now you're ready to do the limit as t approaches 2 of negative 3t plus 1. Okay, how's that look to everybody? I never know. You got two things going on there, factoring that you got to be solid with, and then changing that 2 minus t around. Is there any questions about anything? 3t minus 1 over negative 1, so you just change the signs. Change the signs. Yeah, and see, the reason you're doing that is really you're, anytime you divide something by negative 1, the sign changes in, on an individual thing. So like if you had some, an arithmetic problem like negative 5 plus 1 over negative 1, well, that's negative 4 over negative 1, so it's 4. So really all you got to do is just say, okay, this divided by that would be 5. That divided by that would be negative 1. 
and like that. So it's the same thing. Okay. All right. Now what we're ready to do is plug this in. So now we have negative 3 times 2 plus 1. So that would be negative 6 plus 1. So that's negative 5. So the answer to that limit is negative 5. Okay? So that's, that's the algebra you're going to get into, into in this class. Is factoring is a big deal in calculus. So if you're rusty on that, you need to work heavily on it and fast. Okay? So let's do the calculator on this one also. Then I'll have us finish up with just doing a couple of problems and seeing how your factoring goes. So uh, let's put in... Uh, this one. So, and you use x instead of t, so you would just do parentheses 3x to the second, and then minus 7x, and then plus 2, close parentheses, and then put in the 2 minus x like that. Okay, so that's how you want to put that in. Be sure you have parentheses around numerator and denominator, and then just press graph. Again, you can go zoom 6 to put it in a standard window. And what you're going to find is you're going to find a line comes out. And actually what's coming out is negative 3t plus 1. So if you were graphing y is equal to negative 3t plus 1, well, how would you graph that? What's the y-intercept of that graph? 1. What's the slope? Negative 3, right? So what you can do is you can do this by hand. That's just got a y-intercept of 1. And then the slope is down 3 over 1. So from that point, you can go 1, 2, 3 down over 1. And then you can connect those two dots into your line. But you do have one place where it's undefined. So what happened on this is this thing is undefined at 2, right? Because if t is 2, you have a 0 denominator. So technically what you have is you have, whoops, I'm going at the wrong point there. If you go to 2, you're undefined right there. Okay? Now, that's what the graph looks like. Now, what did we get for our limit? We got negative 5, right? Does that look logical to you? Left-hand limit, negative 5, right? Right-hand limit, negative 5, correct? Okay, so once you do the graphing, it should help you to understand why that's the answer. Okay. Any questions? Okay. All right, go ahead and do the next two. You don't have to graph them. You always can if you want to. Um, but these are both 0 over 0 limits. Try to do the factoring and see if you're on top of your factoring now. Is everybody okay with uh, that they are both zero over zero stuff? Okay, make sure you got that. Now let's see if we got the factoring right on this first one here. Has anybody got an answer to the first one yet? I don't know. I have to work it out. I can't do it in my head. You got four? Okay, let's see if that's right. Okay, so let's see. X approaches three. Okay, now when you do your factoring on this, you have X and X. For three, you're going to do three and one. And then the sign's got to go like this. You've got to have a minus 3 and a plus 1, like that. Okay. Every time you factor something, make sure it's right by multiplying it out, at least in your head. Okay, so then what happened? 
that crosses out, then what do you do? You just plug the number in and evaluate. So you're really doing the limit as x goes to 3 of x plus 1. Now you can plug the 3 in, so that looks like 4 is definitely the right answer. Okay, that's it. Okay? All right. Does that make sense? Okay. How about the next one? Anybody got an answer on that one? Negative 8. Negative 8. I can do that in my head. Okay. So this is what we call a difference of two squares. I want to make sure that you recognize that because that will show up a lot. How does the x squared minus 16 factor? What did you put? xx, 4, 4, plus, yeah, plus minus, like that. So it would be x plus 4, x minus 4. That's a special kind of factoring problem. Then that cancels out. If something's not canceling out, you need to check your factoring. So now you're going to plug in the negative 4 and do negative 4 minus 4 to get negative 8. Okay, and that's it. Okay? All right. That's how you handle the 0 over 0 form of a limit. All right, anybody got any questions about anything I did on that? All right, so we're going to go ahead and start with 10-2. Uh, 10-2 is shorter. The next two sections are...